tonight, the 9th of January 2012. This is the night for the fifth lecture uh, by our beloved Grandmaster Sifu Gariko. Uh, it is on this topic of uh, Chinese culture, history and civilization. And tonight, uh, Sifu will share with us a very special character, a very special person in the history of uh, China, that is uh, Sun Tzu. Uh, Sun Tzu Art of War is the most respected uh, book of strategy around the world. And tonight, we're going to get the insight from Sifu Gariko. My fellow students and friends, thank you for attending Lecture 5 of our series of Chinese culture, civilization and history. The first lecture, you may recall, was about prehistory. And those of you who missed it, I hope you go into it because there are some gems there. Then we moved on from prehistory to the Shang Dynasty, which is the uh, proven and generally accepted uh, oldest dynasty in Chinese history with full records. Obviously, there were previous dynasties like the Xia, but they are not so fully documented, so I didn't go into great detail. From the Shang, which is a strong military tradition, where China was uh, by far the biggest and most powerful nation in the world, uh, had huge cities, eight to ten large cities, um, cities the size that were not seen to at least a thousand years or more later in other countries in the world. And from the Shang Dynasty, we moved to the Zhao Dynasty, which, you know, to me as somebody who has a philosophical bent in my life, philosophical inclination in my life, would identify readily as the core civilization, the core cultural, um, uh, what you call it, uh, uh, high point of Chinese civilization. So we're still in the Zhao Dynasty. The Zhao Dynasty lasted 800 over years. And, um, but the Zhao Dynasty has, uh, for academic terms, been divided into different sections. Early Zhao, which is probably the most um, important part of Chinese cultural history because that's where the highlights of Chinese civilization began. The, the identification of the Chinese persona, our relationship as Chinese people with heaven, earth, the reorganization from our understanding of what the cosmos is to understanding of medicine and warfare and everything else. The high point is the early Zhao with people like Gyeong Tai Kung, who probably is the greatest prime minister in Chinese history, if not the greatest prime minister in the history of the world. So today, when you learn about Sun Ji, you find that there is some connection there. And of course, Zhang Manbong, who, you know, I think correctly identified by the, the best and brightest in Chinese history as the greatest king that ever lived in Chinese history. He may not be called an emperor because he refused to be called an emperor. In fact, when his uh, son, uh, Zhao Mo Wong, created the Zhao dynasty, he was twice petitioned by all the kings, not just of China, outside China, other tribes, to ask him to call himself the emperor. But he refused. And this is the humility of the man. Maybe it's a mistake because on reflection, Qin Shi Huangdi had no qualms about calling himself emperor. So Qin Shi Huangdi became the first emperor. But the reality was Zhao Mo Wang and Zhao Man Wang, before he died, was petitioned by not just the ruling kings of China, on, on the various tribes in China, but outside China to become the first emperor. But never mind, they left a greater legacy than their own names and their own titles. So, and of course, um, there's uh, Zhao Gong Tan, who is also one of my favourites. He's the spiritual master of Confucius. And that's something I can go into great detail later. But Zhao Gong Tan, he's uh, widely admired as you know, one of the greatest people never to become king because he was the younger brother of Zhao Mo Wong. But his sacrifices, his exemplary conduct, his behaviour was um, you know, just spot on as a trustee for a power of what you call a Sip Cheng Wong. That means, you know, Regency King, the guy who held power on behalf of his nephew, Zhao Seng Wong, who was too young at 13 when, when his father died. And of course, he, you know, um, and all these people had fantastic contributions to Chinese, you know, sort of history, civilization, culture, music, you name it. Um, customs, rights, politics. So, down the track, of course, um, Confucius came along. This is the fourth lecture. And Confucius is one of my all-time favourite people, actually. The more I study about him, the more humble I feel and the more I think we should talk about him. And so today, even though the topic is about Sun Ji and Sun Ji during the period of the end of the spring and autumn period. So there's early Zhao Dynasty and then when the Zhao Dynasty capital shifted to the east, to eastern Zhao, it's broken into two parts, the spring and autumn uh, and followed by the warring states period. Now, spring and autumn period, 
the two sort of monumental figures as far as the world recognizes today would be Confucius, whom I mentioned in my last lecture, and the other guy is Xinji. Now at that time, right at that time, Xinji was uh, the sort of the guy. He was the Feng Wan Yan Man. He was the man of the moment. Confucius was not. Uh, although, as time has proved later, Confucius obviously um, is in the class of his own. And that's not to deprecate Sun Ji, who has many fine qualities, but Confucius is really a legal term, sui generis, class of his own. His own, own type of guy, really, really, you know, one class above all the rest. Because Confucius managed, without the resources of wealth, of family, in fact, he didn't even have a father because he was born out of wedlock. Without the patronage, through his own effort and through his wonderful character, he was recognized by the best masters of his time to teach him the most important um, learnings, which he then passed on to us through the, what we call the six uh, subjects, Lok Ngai, which he passed on, which is a, a core curriculum to transfer the concept of what a Guan Ji or in the original term meaning nobleman or son of the Lord to all and sundry. In fact, his students include people who are so poor they were dining out of dustbins and eating out of alleyways. He taught the poorest people. He taught people irrespective of the background. He realized that the best genes in the world is no guarantee that the successive generation will be just as good. And we know from the early Chao kings, these were the finest people probably in the history of China. But at some stage, the genes weakened. And, you know, even though they were direct descendants from the Chao dynasty, they weren't such good kings. And so the kingdom started slipping away. So by the time Confucius came along, he decided the only way to rejuvenate the country is to make these core disciplines that were taught to the noblemen, make them available at the highest level to all and sundry. And because he did that, and to today, uh, in my humble opinion, all the research I've done, no country, no civilization, no teacher, has ever taught such a comprehensive curriculum that he did, those six subjects that I told you about. And, you know, and to teach it with that degree of introspection, to teach it with that passion, to teach it with that um, inspiration, that so much so, 77 generations after Confucius passed away, until the Republic of China was formed, 40-odd generations were made dukes, his descendants, and 30-odd were made lords. 30-odd generations Ji Hao, 40-odd generations Kong, which is the highest level after the king. No other person in the history of the world, lineage-wise, has got 77 generations being made lords. Not in China, not anywhere. So there you are. This is the contribution of this great man. And it's not, not just the Chinese who honoured it, the Han Chinese. When the Mongolians came in, they did the same thing. They honoured his children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And when the Manchurians came in, they did the same thing. So it's not confined to the Han Chinese. Okay? So, all right. But in, the, in his day, why do I say Confu Confucius with uh, Sun Ji? Sun Ji and, them, and Confucius were contemporaries. Whether they met or not, I don't know. I don't think they did. But Sun Ji was actually born a few years after Confucius. And Sun Ji died many years before Confucius. Confucius lived to about 72, 3 years of age. And Sun Ji lived to 48. Now, before I go on and talk about Sun Ji, I must define my terms. Who is Sun Ji? Sun Ji, if you look through the literature, if you look through the facts, Sun Ji is actually used a term, a term used to talk about two different characters. Sun Mo, the ancestor, and Sun Pan, the descendant. And both of them are equally illustrious. Alright. Who is Sun Pan and who is Sun, Sun Mo? Towards the end of the spring and autumn period, really the Chinese world was descending into huge chaos. From one unified empire under the Chao dynasty, it reached a stage where there were close to 300 different little kingdoms. Now, people say to me, but see, for them, the Chao dynasty doesn't exist. How can there be 300 kingdoms in one dynasty? You see, Chinese relationships are so complex, I can't even begin to explain to you, but let's simplify it by explaining this way. Almost all the kingdoms that existed in, uh, under the Chao dynasty were actually um, parcels of land given to people who were related either by blood or marriage to the Chao Emperor in the first place, the Chao King. So 
so these so-called kingdoms, dukedoms, whatever you call them, lorddoms, barondoms, they were actually people who were, you know, cousins, in-laws, nephews, brothers of the original Chao King. So you, they, they were all related. So, so to say that they didn't have a right to claim to the throne is not, not, not exactly true. They did have some right of claim. They were bloodline. So give you an example, for much of uh, the Chao uh, dynasty until the Warring State period, middle of the Warring State period, the, probably the strongest, the most educated, the most vogue um, dukedom or kingdom in the Chao dynasty was Chai. Chai is modern day Shandong basically, uh, a little bit more, a little bit more, but uh, Chai and next to it uh, in the southwest of Shandong is Loi. So Confucius was born in Loi and our friend Sun Mo was born in Chai. Chai was the most woke place. I mean, you know, they later down I'll try to explain to you, not, not now. They, they had the first or the most woke international university at, at uh, Linji, which is uh, sort of, you know, modern day San, Sandong, one of the towns there. Now, why was it so woke? There are two reasons for that. Basically, when the first uh, Chao King um, passed on, um, the country was parceled up. And Chao Gong Tan, the, the great, um, you know, Sip Cheng Wong, was given Loi, which is southwest corner of Santong, where Confucius grew up. And Confucius, in fact, the, the temple next to Confucius' temple is uh, Chao Gong Tan's temple, his spiritual master, who, who actually gave him all the inspiration to write all those great things, including being the third contributor to the Ye King. All right, Chai was parceled out to Kyung Tai Kung and his descendants. So Chai is actually given to Zhao Mo Wong's father-in-law. Zhao Mo Wong is the founder of the Zhao dynasty. Okay, he named his father as the first founder, but his father died during the civil war. Zhao, Zhao Man Wong died during the civil war. Zhao Mo Wong is the, physically the first emperor, the first unified China. So Chai was given to Kyung Tai Kung, his father-in-law. And of course Kyung Tai Kung is not interested in that, given to his sons and all that. So, so basically Chai is Kyung Tai Kung territory. And Loi is Zhao Kong Tan's territory. So the two most important members of the royal family, minus the king. One is his brother who ran the region, who ran, ran the kingdom for, for seven years while his son was growing up from 1378 years. And the other is his father-in-law and the field marshal, come commander-in-chief, come advisor, come prime minister, come sifu of his father, Zhao Men Wong, and, and himself. So, you know, these two most important parts of China, the best parts, the most, at that stage, they were the most prosperous parts because, the, you know, everything was there. If, if everybody's going to Sandong, and I, I know Sandong well, it's my home province, it, it has everything. It has a beautiful seaboard, wonderful seafood, it's got rivers, it's got mountains. San Ming, so you saw, it's uh, even Tai San is there. And you just, you just name it, it's just, it's just the place to be. And, and still one of the nicest places in China. So this is where it was. And at that stage, China was descending into chaos. And so Confucius took the high moral road. And God bless him, I think he's a fantastic guy because he thought that the highest toll was the toll of peace. And irrespective of the fact that everybody was crying for war, 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 more guns, more whatever, more weapons, more, more military advisors, more generals, more, more provisions for war, Confucius said, no, the way out is peace. And although at, in his time, everybody rejected him, and I can understand why, at the end of the day, we all know Confucius was right. But of course, in his time, nobody could understand his message or felt it wasn't sort of the right thing they wanted to hear. Well, Sin Mo obviously had something that the rest of the world wanted. Now, before we go into details about, you know, sort of uh, his principles and testimonials which go on forever, let's understand one thing. Sin Mo is not a warmonger. There's a lot of people make out there to be Sin Mo, so a guy who just couldn't wait to get into a scrap, or couldn't wait to, you know, sell his body, mind, soul and military tactics to the highest bidder. No, not true. Actually, Sin Mo is a very highly achieved Taoist master, highly skilled sword master. His Kung Fu and Qi Kung is very highest level. He was very disturbed that the world was descending into disorder. And he felt that his skills and knowledge should be passed on to the most just, kind, righteous ruler among those guys who were fighting for, for control of China. And then that person should control the country. So he, he, he was uh, somebody of noble intention.